I am honored to welcome Mel Watkins. Uh, for students in the class, you know Professor Watkins as the author of On the Real Side. Um, among his other published books, a wonderful biography of uh, Stephen Fetchett, uh, called Stephen Fetchett in the Life and Times of Lincoln Perry, um, which I've also in the past had the opportunity to teach. Um, he's also the author of a memoir, uh, Dancing with Strangers, a memoir which came out in 2010. Um, and he is working on part two. Yeah, and part two of that, uh, it's the continuation talking about uh, Starting out the New York Times in the early in the right. mid '60s, when there were no black people there. Right. Professor Watkins was hired to the New York Times um, in the early 1960s, becoming the first African American to work at the New York Times Book Review. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the first editor at the New first York editor of the New York Times I'd Book probably, Review. Yeah, the first to work there. Yeah, there was no one else. <laughs> there were elevator operators and uh, janitors at the New York Times when I got there. So. Yeah. I um, and, and I'm sure Professor um, Powell will appreciate this also. Um, when I was coming up um, in graduate school and thinking about writing about popular culture and things of the like, um, you were one of the people that I went to because there weren't a lot of folks doing popular culture in the academy. Okay, it's true. And popular culture had not become a, a focus of uh, journalists at that point. It's uh, it started to become that in the 70s. I guess. Yeah, in part because of you. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. But, uh, we, we started to do some stuff on it, and I was interested in it from the uh, beginning. And there, after uh, getting an elite, a, a grant to study humor in 1979, I was able to uh, get, become even more interested. In okay. uh, let me start a little bit with, with some of your biography. Um, you, you grew up in Ohio. Um, and you went to Colgate, um, and for folks who don't mo know much about Colgate, Colgate is kind of an Ivy League school. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it considers itself. And I can tell you a story of the reason they're not in the Ivy League is because when the Ivy League was formed, Colgate was the number two football team <laughs> college in the nation, and they did not want uh, sports uh, institutions in the, Ivy League, in the Ivy League, so they did not allow them in. So. <laughs> You were there at a time when there were not many African-American students. No, uh, very few. Seven in my class when I came in, yeah. yeah. How did you end up, so many years later, becoming a professor at Colgate? I'd gone back a few times. I graduated uh, in 1962, so I've been around a long time. Um, I graduated, uh, or when I graduated, I took two years and then went to the Times, and once I started writing for the Times, some people at Colgate suddenly realized that they knew me because I graduated from there. But uh, uh, I got there because of basketball, basically. I was, uh, was an all-state basketball player at Ohio. So uh, I had, had some offers and uh, narrowed it down to three schools and uh, ended up going to Colgate because it was somewhere in the middle and also because my basketball coach in Youngstown, Ohio, knew the basketball coach at Colgate, and he therefore put me in, uh, in touch with him, and uh, there was a, more of a sense of uh, being familiar with that than if I'd gone to Dartmouth, which was one of the other schools of the University of Pittsburgh. Those were the other two. So, how did you get interested in comedy? In what? In comedy, writing about comedy and comics. And comedy was a, it was a, an abrupt change because uh, I was interested in writing. I was doing uh, book reviews. I was working with a book review doing. Uh, interviews with authors like uh, Baraka and uh, Alex Haley and Toni Morrison and so forth and reviews of, of books by various people. Um, but Richard Pryor is the person who d interested me in uh, comedy. Uh, when I heard uh, Richard Pryor, I saw the 1979 uh, live in concert show. Mm -hmm. I thought that he was doing more or as much in terms of revealing aspects of African American culture than some of the uh, novelists were. So I was immediately interested in it and started to pursue it a little bit more. And several things came together because what happened was uh, at uh, a certain point, the editor of the book review changed and I wasn't very happy with him, didn't like it. I was ready to move to the sports department and instead decided to uh, put in, uh, uh, to write a uh, proposal for a grant. And I got the grant in 1979. So I, from 1979 to 1980, I was doing research on comedy. Uh, and that was inspired by Richard Pryor 
but the research then got me more deeply involved in it, and I started to uh, uncover all these other stories that I found fascinating, yeah. step invention among them. So. You know, you're a books editor at the New York Times, um, by this time, 14 or 15 years. Um, oh. <laughs> As an African American that was at the Times, um, you probably had a lot of contact with some of the major black literati yes. of that era. Yes. It was, uh, in fact, I was telling some, I was just talking about the fact that before I came down here on Tuesday, I did a uh, colloquium at, uh, at Colgate and talked about some of the things that had happened because this is my last year at Colgate and they wanted me to, to talk about uh, what had happened to me at the Times and so forth. And I also, as I said, I'm writing about it now. But yes, I, I did know uh, uh, a lot of people. Toni Morrison was a fairly good friend. She wrote the endorsement for Dancing with Strangers. Mm -hmm. It's on the cover of that book. Mm -hmm. uh, Alice Walker, uh, I talked about. Alice Walker, I, uh, I, <clears throat> I met early on, reviewed The Color Purple for The Times and got to know her. Um, Ishmael Reed is a very good friend of mine. I'm still in touch with Ishmael Reed. Cecil Brown, people like that, are people that I knew fairly well. James Baldwin, in fact, in fact uh, I used to, used to hang out with James Baldwin because he was, uh, his uh, publishing house, Dial Press, uh, had a woman who was the PR director, the publicity director, who was from Youngstown, Ohio also. And when Baldwin came into town and he published a book, um, she, it was her job to hang out with him, to go have dinner with him, to take him around and show him the city. And instead, because he, she didn't drink, Baldwin drank about six double black Dan or, or Johnny Walker blacks uh, in an evening. That was his, <laughs> that was the way he rolled. Uh, she would ask me if I would stay with him. I would have dinner with him. She would leave, and then Baldwin and I would hang out and go up, end up at McKell's on uh, Columbus Avenue and uh, 97th Street, where his brother worked as a bartender. Yeah. So I would leave Baldwin there and drag myself home. But uh, yeah, so he was, uh, it was fascinating knowing him. The number of people like that. Baraka I knew fairly well. Uh, so talked about some of those people, yeah. When you make that shift from this literary world to starting to think about comics, you know, there's some folks that would see, think, well, you know, it's, it, it doesn't match up. You know, you, are, are you going from this highbrow world of African-American fiction writers and, and literature fig literary figures to just writing about a comic who's on stage cussing about stuff? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it, it seems like, uh, I guess, an abrupt change from the outside, but in, to me it was not. As I said, I thought uh, Pryor was touching on some subjects and dealing with, with some things that I thought were very important in terms of African American culture and revealing some aspects of that culture that even some of the, the writers were not dealing with. So uh, I think I, tr I tried to get into that to a certain extent in this book to talk about the fact that uh, Richard Pryor was, one of the reasons he was important is because he brought those things to the fore. His uh, tact of dealing with the marginal people in the African American community, dealing with pimps and uh, uh, drunks, junkies, what have you, uh, and humanizing them, drawing them in such a way that you really felt sympathy for them, um, fascinated me. And uh, I think he did that better than even some of the novelists at the time. I mean, the only person I think that, that really was close to, to that, to uh, dealing with those people, depicting those people, would be someone like Chester Himes, perhaps, who uh, dealt with Harlem nightlife and, uh, to a certain extent, and in a literary sense, dealt with some of the people that uh, Baldwin dealt with. Right, books like Cotton Comes to Harlem, well, the, the book that inspired the film, Cotton Comes to Harlem, and, and things of that yeah. nature. Yeah. One of the people that, of course, we're dealing with in the class, the reason for the class is Dick Gregory. Um, Dick Gregory would have come on the scene about the time that, you know, you started writing for the New York Times. What were your initial impressions of, of Dick Gregory? Oh, I was fascinated with, with, with Gregory. I lived, at a, I lived in Harlem at a time when the Apollo Theater uh, was, was a place that I went to every, practically every week. Uh, every show that and, came I, and I'm trying to process that, process that for a moment <laughs> right being able to just roll up to the Apollo theater yeah it's like every uh, week when the Apollo theater was literally the premier place in which African Americans absolutely. came to perform yeah. yeah 
In fact, I, uh, one summer, the summer between my junior and senior years at Colgate, I lived in Harlem, I had a job, a summer job for working for the Daily News as a copy boy. So I worked, uh, I was working for the Daily News and I was living in Harlem and I would go to uh, the Apollo every week because it cost a dollar and a quarter to go to. And some of the best shows I've ever seen in my life were at the Apollo Theater. I remember one in particular, and these names may not, uh, to some of the students may not be familiar, but uh, uh, and perhaps they will be, it depends on if you like jazz or not. But the, the show had Nancy Wilson, the Cannonball Adderley Quartet, the uh, Flip, or, uh, Flip Wilson was the host and uh, the comic for that show. And um, th those kind of shows were the kind of shows you could see for a dollar and a quarter. Th th some of the best uh, possible uh, entertainers, black entertainers in the world were there and you, uh, you could watch the show as many times as you wanted, usually except on weekends. So if you wanted, you could go and see two performances of these shows. It's, so it was um, really a unique experience. So yes, and uh, going there every week was like walking down the street from me. I lived, I lived about uh, five blocks from the Apollo Theater at that point on 127th Street. So uh, I got to see a lot of people. That got me interested in the entertainment. So, When did you first become aware of Dick Gregory? Gregory, uh, I saw the Apollo for one thing. Later on, uh, at first, uh, I didn't see the first show. It was there. I understand I wrote about it again in some, I'm not sure if I wrote about it here or, or somewhere else, but his first appearance there, he was not received very well. Then by the end of the night, apparently people started to, uh, to feel more comfortable with him because they found out what he was doing. Gregory's humor was not the typical humor that you would see at the Apollo Theater because in the 60s, they were still doing the kind of humor with, that we would expect from Pygmy Markham. Slapstick, right, they're still yeah. doing, right, sla slapstick. Slapstick, or yeah. it's a sketch humor, not stand-up humor. Right. And you would have, they had a, a cast of uh, comedians and uh, comic actors, an ensemble cast uh, that uh, performed there, and they were, uh, they were very good at what they did, but it was sketch humor, it was not to, it was not stand-up at all. The Apollo, as, as we, you know from your class, I'm sure, that uh, African-American comics did not talk directly to audiences initially. They talked to one another. And uh, that was, it was considered, there were very few stand-up or African-American stand-up comics. Some people think that Moms Mabley would, be, would have been the first. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was that aspect of it. But uh, Dick was very popular there then. And he was the talk of the town. Uh, once he appeared, by the end of, uh, what, 1961, he was on the cover of uh, Time magazine. Uh, he was uh, well known and uh, people were talking about him. He was a, a figure of interest, an entertainer who was making a major breakthrough. And everyone who was inter interested in comedy or interested in entertainment at all, uh, or black African-American culture, would have known about him. So some of the writers were aware of him also. When we talked earlier, you mentioned that you know, Dick Gregory obviously is an extraordinary talent, but part of what makes Dick Gregory Dick Gregory is the historical era in which he emerged, um, and particularly his relationship with the civil rights movement. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, it, to talk about Gregory, it seems to me you have to talk about the comics that just uh, preceded him. Uh, as I said, or just mentioned, comedy up to a certain point, African-American comedy was basically the kind of comedy you saw on the so-called Chitlin circuit. It was a uh, sketch comedy, usually it was generally profane. It very seldom dealt with uh, social issues. It had very little social commentary involved with it at that time, uh, in the 50s that is. But a few comics started to change it a bit, and I'll just run down uh, some of the stuff that preceded uh, Gregory. That is, uh, Timmy Rogers was one who in the uh, late 40s decided that he was he would not no longer wear the baggy pants and the oversized shoes that the other comics were wearing on stage. He would wear a tuxedo and go out and, and not speak in dialect. He would not do what, what, I start to, what I started to call the stage Negro act or the Sambo act, whatever you want to call it. But African-American comedy to a certain extent was distinguished by that Sambo figure, that uh, stage Negro who spoke in dialect. And it was a Negro dialect basically that had very little to do even with Negroes, with blacks. It was a, a dialect that had been foisted upon them because whites had portrayed blacks in the theater, on the stage, and in films up until that time. And 
for, the, for mainstream America, they had become accustomed to hearing white people <laughs> determining the dialect, the way African Americans spoke. So when you got a job as a comedian at that point, you almost had to speak the same way. Uh, I mean, the Amos and Andy TV show, for instance, Tim Moore, comedians like that, complained about the fact that uh, when they were on that show, they had uh, uh, non-black actors telling them how to speak black. in Negro dialect or teaching them how to speak so that the audience would accept them as being black. So this is the backdrop. When Tommy Rogers decides I'm no longer going to wear the baggy pants and the oversized shoes and starts to actually speak in uh, non-dialect English, uh, the first time he did it, in fact, he was fired on the spot. They told him to get out. But uh, gradually, he uh, d established an act, developed an act that worked, and he did that for a while. He did some social commentary and started to change the way comedians, African-American comedians, were accepted in um, mainstream venues. Uh, and again, I want to be clear that we're talking now about the way they performed in mainstream venues, because African-American comedians in, in black venues uh, performed naturally without speaking the dialect that was foisted upon them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I want to talk, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this, this notion of the stage Negro. I mean, when, when you think back and you read about when Frederick Douglass first travels to Europe and, and white audience were shocked at the way that he spoke, because they expected to hear dialect yeah. right, from him. Um, we can even go forward you know, 40 years past you know, Timmy Rogers' era and, and conversations that rap artists are having with white industry insiders who are telling them, well, that doesn't sound hood enough, <laughs> um, as if somehow they had an actual relationship yeah. with the hood to be able to dictate what a, a rapper from the hood is supposed to sound like. Yeah, and you've had that all along. I think. To me, one of the most fascinating things about entertainment in general in America, about the media and entertainment in general, is the perception of black people and the perception um, that they at first were simply considered funny. That to be black was to be funny. <laughs> secondly, on the stage, you first had whites portraying blacks in blackface. But then you, if you move from the stage, the next thing that happened is you in films, you had uh, blacks initially in films were portrayed by whites. Uh, if you go on to radio, again, blacks are initially portrayed by whites. Right, original Amos and Andy. Literature even, for the most part. The first written accounts, uh, humorous accounts of black people were written by white authors. Uh, Octopus Roy Coyne uh, was one of the most famous writers in America because he wrote about uh, blacks. He was considered the Negro of Zoe Henry. So you have Right, Joe All Chandler the, Harris, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And well, Chandler Harris, a little bit different since he actually took tales, and he was pretty, those tales weren't that distorted. It was the way he presented them right, right, that right. was distorted because right. he had a uh, sort of an Uncle Tom figure right. presenting them, and they, they really were tales that were quite uh, revolutionary or rebellious yeah, right, in right. the sense that they had another meaning. The way Joel Chandler Harris presented them was to defuse them of any of that meaning and present right. them as silly tales told by uh, black people who weren't very smart to a small child. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it's in every aspect of American media up until the, uh, certainly up until uh, television, you had blacks or you had non-blacks portraying blacks and they established the uh, basis, the foundation or the, the, uh, the acceptable depiction of blacks in each of those uh, venues. Yeah. So you mentioned other folks that kind of set a precedent for Gregory. Uh, so I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, other folks who were kind of uh, set precedents for oh, Gregory's okay. emergence. Well, started with Timmy Rogers, but right. then uh, there were three comics who really had, uh, who, who really show the development of uh, the movement from the Pygmeek Markhams and the Dusty Fletchers, uh, and Dusty Fletcher, I don't know in your class if you dealt with Dusty Fletcher, but he did uh, open the door of Richard. So you had the Dusty Fletchers and the Pygmeek Markhams doing kind of slapstick, uh, acrobatic comedy, and uh, all dressed the same way, right, basically. Right. Um, Slappy White was the other comic who changed. T Timmy Rogers, Slappy White, and Nipsey Russell were the three comics who really started to change this. And Slappy White, uh, uh, 
in fact, worked with Red Fox at one time. They had a duo called uh, uh, Red, and, Red and White. And they would come out and, uh, <laughs> and just and say, I'm red, I'm white, and people would break up. <laughs> so it's like you had that going on. Uh, Slappy White then uh, worked. Uh, he was considered, I think some people called him the father of the integrated joke. Uh, the owner of the Apollo, Frank Schiffman, uh, thought that he was one of the most intelligent comedians around even though he worked uh, an act that really mirrored the stage Negro to a certain extent. He spoke in dialect most of the time because that's the way he was taught to speak. And that's the way uh, the venues that hired him wanted him to, to speak. Uh, there's some anecdotes in, in, on the real side about that because a good friend of mine, Junior Manns, the pianist, mm -hmm. um, he worked um, with or toured in shows in which Slappy White was a comedian at times. And he told me some stories about what happened with Slappy because Slappy White later on started to move away from presenting the stage Negro and tried to do something else, something more complicated, uh, as, as did Timmy Rogers. And on several occasions, Slappy White was fired also. And, and on one occasion, attempted to be fired and only was uh, kept because other people stepped in and said, well, if you fire him, we're all leaving. So uh, that was one of the situations with Slappy White. He, Ultimately, started to work with a, um, with a guy named Steve Rossi, a white comedian. And they, he moved on really into mainstream by having a duo with a white comedian. So it gives you some idea of how far he moved from this stage Negro that had been presented before. And the other was Nipsey Russell. And Nipsey Russell was uh, probably the best known of these three guys because Nipsey Russell uh, worked... Um, was known from television. Uh, he was on Hollywood Squares, I believe. And, uh, What's My Line? <laughs> yeah, What's My Line, What's various my line? places. Yeah. Nipsey Russell actually was a, <laughs> was a prodigy. Uh, Nipsey Russell, I believe, graduated from college at 18. He was a, a very smart guy. And yet he still did some of, early on, still worked those Chitlin Circuit right. venues and uh, was capable of doing the kind of comedy that was popular in those shows. When he started to, uh, to move up, uh, he became very intelligent. He never used dialect, but he would use some of the jokes that those people use because he was too smart to use a dialect. In fact, he was criticized by Timmy Rogers sometimes because Timmy Rogers thought that he used a vocabulary that was uh, not acceptable or not understood by most of the black audience. So he, uh, he had been criticized by people for doing that. But he, be he became very popular. He was known for the rhyming cup couplets right. and so forth. He was considered the poet laureate of comedy by some people uh, and was very, very successful. Of those three guys, he was the most successful. And um, it was at the Apollo a lot. I saw him a couple of times at the Apollo Theater for, for one thing, but he also worked the Catskills, the Jewish uh, hotels. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He worked uh, mainstream venues. He worked downtown in Manhattan, so he worked everywhere. He's uh, an interesting guy. And out of this all comes, of course, Dick Gregory. And Gregory had watched all of them and watched what they were doing, and Gregory had decided he didn't want to work the black clubs, and he never really did uh, work them uh, for any extended period of time. That's not to say that he didn't occasionally work them, but he never did it for an extended period of time. He worked some white clubs, and um, as he said, he wanted to work the white, ven <clears throat> the white venues because that's where the bread was, that's where the money was, and that's what he wanted to do, so. Yeah. How much do you think a young Bill Cosby was influenced by someone like Dick Gregory? I think that any, any African-American comedian coming up at that time would have been influenced by Dick Gregory because uh, Dick Gregory was really the first African-American comedian to break through in the mainstream. Uh, there had been, not since Burt Williams, had there been a stage comedian to break through in that way. Stephen Fetchett was a, a comedian who was well known and popular, but he was a movie actor, a comic actor more than a comedian. So you had that situation going on. Um, Dick Gregory's breakthrough was unheard of for most people. He was so popular that uh, most people probably couldn't even believe it. I was uh, astounded when I realized how, um, how successful he had become and how uh, he was being accepted. So anyone working as a comedian would have immediately said, I want to do that. That's yeah, the kind of success yeah, that I want. Right. And one of the things that Dick Gregory did was to uh, mold his act in such a way 
that all of those, uh, those elements that had distinguished that uh, Chitlin circuit comedy were taken out. No profanity, no dialect, uh, no um, real focus on the, the inner workings of, of the black community to a certain extent. Ghetto life, right. <laughs> yeah, he moved to a, a different view of the world was reflected in his comedy. And certainly he moved on to talk about social issues in a way that none of, uh, or very few of the other comics had. And the ones who had were minor, as I said, Timmy Rogers did it occasionally, Slappy White did it occasionally, Nipsey Russell did it occasionally, but they never broke through. And, uh, and they also never did it as, uh, as vividly or as, with as much impact as Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory had some jokes that were, that really dealt with the, uh, the current issues, contemporary issues, and, and the, uh, the fact that the civil rights movement was going on at that time. So he was dealing with, uh, with actual situations and talking about them in terms of some, of, of, uh, well, talking about them in a way that reflected what was going on in the community. For instance, the, uh, the sit-ins and so forth. He talked about sit-ins. He talked about uh, uh, the busing. He talked about marches and so forth. He talked about the <clears throat> the obvious uh, Jim Crow nature of the South. Uh, some of his jokes were based entirely on those situations. And he also brought into play black folklore. To me, that was one of the crucial aspects of what Dick Gregory did. He started to use black folklore in a different way. Uh, jokes like the joke where the <clears throat> where the, um, a white um, individual drives to his neighborhood, which had been all white for a while, and he sees a black man out cutting the lawn, and yes, uh, he says he's, he's doing a good job, and yes, uh, when you finish there, could you come over and do something for my house? Where do you get paid? And the, the guy who's cutting the lawn says, I get to sleep with the woman of the house. Uh, I'll be right over if you want me to. So these kind of jokes were really from the that were really from the, the black communities. What he was re re doing was revealing some of the jokes that had been around all the time in the black community, but had never been told in mixed venues up until that time. Some of them yeah. did, were told in black clubs, in black theaters, but even there, there was a problem because most of those clubs were owned by whites. And if someone told a joke that was really uh, rebellious in any sense, or really uh, started to suggest that blacks were equal to whites, the owner of that club or that theater would have objected to it, right. and the person might not have worked. Right. So there was always limitations as to what one could do up until a certain point. It was only the civil rights movement that sort of unleashed that and allowed people more freedom, and Gregory took advantage of it. Let's talk about that folklore for a second. Um, in class on Tuesday night, I played for the class uh, Etheridge Knight um, reading I Sing a Shine. <laughs> okay. All right, you know, with Shine in the Titanic. Um, and, and the thing that I always recall about these kind of folklore stories were the extent in which they actually did circulate in everyday black life, right? Kids who were playing the dozens, yeah. for instance, would draw from this folklore tradition. Talk about how important that was in the days before someone like Dick Gregory couldn't make this wealth of storytelling available to, to a larger audience. Yeah, the stories were uh, part of the, uh, the dialogue that existed in the inner community. And for instance, the Titanic or Shine and the sinking of the Titanic was obviously done sh shortly. Or some people don't know, well, it's hard to figure out exactly when it was right. created. But it was somewhere, most people think, between 1912 and 1920. Right. So that's how far back this tale goes. And the tale, is really about a, a, a sort of superhuman black man <laughs> who thumbs his nose at uh, white society and, and all the people on the Titanic who in the, the, the poem of the ballad, whatever you want to call it, or it's, some people call it the toast because some of these stories were told by pimps and right. again, marginal right. people right. Uh, on the outskirts of uh, the middle class and, or the, the black community. But um, it's a rebellious story about someone thumbing his nose at the uh, establishment, and in this case, the establishment is the Titanic and all the people on it. And every time one of them comes and asks for help from him, he tells them, "No, you're on your own." And, and goes on to talk about the fact that of what they had done to him and how they ignored him up until this point. So why should he help them now? So you had that situation going on with the, with that story. 
Many of these stories were just stories of, of so-called bad, and I'll just say bad Negroes. That's not the term that's used in the book. <laughs> that's, that's not the term we use in class on Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So these bad Negroes were, uh, were either fictional characters like Shine, or they were some real-life characters like uh, Jack Johnson, who was a, uh, a, character, a fighter, I guess. You, perhaps you talked about him. Jack Johnson was the first <laughs> black heavyweight champion, and uh, he was the uh, champion who... Uh, actually provoked the search for the so-called great white hope. And there's a play and a movie based on Jack Johnson about right. that because uh, to be a heavyweight champion at that time in America uh, was uh, to disrupt uh, the hierarchy. The, uh, the norm was to uh, challenge the norm in a way that uh, the mainstream did not readily accept and uh, tried to overturn that, tried to find some non-black fighter who could beat him. Uh, in fact, when he won fights, it was dangerous for black people because if black people went out and celebrated him winning, there were often riots, and whites would come into the black community and beat white people, or black people, because they were celebrating Jack Johnson's having defeated a white fighter. This is how real this whole situation was, was uh, taken at that point, and how much it, uh, there were, uh, reverberations within the black community simply because the heavyweight champion was black. But he was considered one of these bad Negroes, and he also flaunted all of the rules of uh, the time. He, uh, uh, it's said that he drove his, his uh, Cadillac convertible through Mississippi with a blonde at a time when most people would have been hanged before they left, uh, before they got over the New Jersey line. But apparently, this is what the story is. The legend of Jack Johnson is, is immense. He, uh, some people say that uh, uh, the Man Act was created because of Jack Johnson and his, uh, his dallying with uh, non-black women. Uh, others contend that the word Johnson in its other meaning, um, referring to a part of the uh, male anatomy, uh, was based on Jack Johnson. So you have all of these things that, that, that tie into the legend of Jack Johnson to a certain extent. One of the things we did in class around this subject was to kind of think about attributes that would fit into the context of what one would call a bad Negro mm -hmm. um, and look for both historical and fictional examples of it and, and then try to look for more contemporary examples of that. Um, yep. and, and I wonder, given the utility of the quote-unquote bad nigger, in the early 20th century, you know, as one particular moment, whether or not there's still a utility for a figure like that in black life in, in 2019. It's, it's very, it would be very difficult now because most, uh, the kind of uh, def, diffidence that was paid to, uh, to, to white society and even in Jim Crow situations before doesn't really exist as much, but some of the people, the incidents of uh, black, uh, males being shot in cars probably has something to do with that, that is refusing to go along with obvious intimidation or the attempt right. to humiliate, right. publicly humiliate. And that was part of what was going on, and that's something that uh, the so-called bad Negro did not deal with. I think Sterling Brown defined that the bad Negro as someone who refused to uh, kowtow to, the, the, to unjust laws, unjust situations, and refuse to, uh, and, and in fact, flaunted their rebellion against those laws right. and let people know outwardly that that was what was going on. So that's part of it. It's a refuse to accept staying in your place. Uh, one of the things I point out again in, in, in the book is that to that extent, Rosa Parks could be considered a <laughs> bad Negro because she refused I actually think to someone keep, said that in class. <laughs> yeah, to keep her, yeah, to keep her spot on the, in the back of the bus so that... Uh, that term really refers to, to many things that uh, and can be looked at in many different ways. Folks will make a, a, an easy line from Dick Gregory to Richard Pryor in the 1970s, but one of the, the people that often gets forgotten in late 60s and early 70s is Flip Wilson. Oh, yeah. Um, well, one of my favorite comics. And, and talk a little bit, put Flip Wilson's legacy in some context. <clears throat> All right, I, yeah, because I, I love Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson came along... Um, <clears throat> Right after uh, Gregory and um, Godfrey Cambridge, and we haven't mentioned Godfrey Cambridge before, but Godfrey Cambridge came along at about this, just after Dick Gregory came along. And Godfrey Cambridge was also a comedian who um, varied from um, 
non-racial comedy to some very uh, heavy and uh, penetrating racial um, comedy that dealt with the, the again, the hypocrisy of, of the of mainstream society. And who physically uh, looked a bit like Dick Gregory when Dick Gregory was heavier. Yeah, they yeah they did look a lot. In fact, uh, there was a guy. There's a book uh, about uh, that mentions both of them by a white critic. His name is Knackman, who uh, talked about them both having droopy eyes. And uh, if you if you remember Godfrey Cambridge, he did have that look about him. His, right, his eyes right. were were droopy, and that, which um, gave a false impression of what they were doing because it made people feel that they were sleepy and not really interested in what what right, they were saying. Right. On the other hand. Their commentary was often crisp and exactly to the point and uh, very satiric. So you had this, this uh, contrast between appearance and what was being said with right. Gregory and with Godfrey Cambridge. So that, that was part of what was, uh, what was going on. The, um, in terms of, <coughs> of Flip Wilson, however, he followed these two comics. Uh, Flip Wilson had started out <coughs> Flip Wilson has started out on the uh, Chitlin circuit to a certain extent, working black clubs and so forth. But Flip Wilson was a storyteller. He, was, uh, he, he told stories and uh, really immersed himself in black culture and, he, and was exuberantly, uh, it, well, exuberantly portrayed or depicted black characters. And that's what he brought to the forefront. He had a character called, called Reverend Leroy, for instance. Um, he had a character, a female character called Geraldine. And both these characters were, were very um, vividly portrayed. They were characters who glorified in the way black people acted. They were very proud of black culture. They reflected in everything they did. They spoke the way people would probably speak in the ghetto and, and, and for real. That is, that they, it wasn't dialect, but it was not always proper English. It was uh, a realistic interpretation of the way people spoke. And he drew these characters very, very well. They were people who loved black life, who, uh, who reflected that love of black life, took pride in black life. Uh, Geraldine, uh, some of the phrases were, uh, you, you can look but don't touch. What you, say, what you see is what you get. These were all comments by, by Geraldine. Uh, Reverend Leroy was one of the, to me, one of the funniest uh, depictions of the black preacher that was around. Uh, if, if you, if people here know Richard Pryor, and on television, Richard Pryor used to do a, uh, a send-up of the black preacher. And Richard Pryor's send-up of the black preacher, the preacher was really based on what Flip Wilson did with Reverend Leroy. He just, uh, uh, Richard Pryor took it a little bit further and uh, did it a little bit differently. But Flip Wilson uh, brought all that exuberance to there, his love of black people, his love of, of black life. He brought it to the characters, and in some of the comedy that he did, there was a indirect or hidden um, criticism of the mainstream. He did reflect it in certain ways. What he liked to do, for instance, is to take historical characters and impose a, aspects of black life on those characters. One of his most famous acts is Christopher Columbus, for instance. I don't know if you know the Christopher Columbus joke, but it's about, uh, uh, it is about Columbus's discovery of America and about Queen Isabella's reaction to it. And when, when she gives money to Christopher Columbus, she's saying, uh, and Chris tells her, I'm going to America. I'm going to find Ray Charles. And this is the way he sort of talked. And then and Queen Isabella, who then spoke in the voice of, uh, of Geraldine, says, you going to find Ray Charles? <laughs> You go ahead and bring back those, and, and Chris goes on to explain, that's where all those records come from. Ray Charles is over there, we gotta find him. And so he does this whole bit on it. It's like, it's, it's funny as hell. If you haven't heard Flip Wilson do that, it's on YouTube for people who haven't heard it. Go take a look at it, it's funny as hell. Uh, he does Christopher Columbus and, he, Columbus, and he does other stories in the same vein. That is taking historical incidents and imposing this, uh, imposing, aspects of black culture on it and actually making some of these famous historical figures into black people. So they become uh, representations of black life to a certain extent. And he was one of the most popular comedians of the early 70s. In fact, he was the first African-American comedian to have a successful variety show that went on. It was number, at one point, one year it was number one on television for back when being number one on the television networks was very important. He was on for five or six years. 
Uh, he made so much money that he ultimately uh, just yeah, quit. Yeah. He left. He, uh, he actually uh, uh, was, was wisely invested his money, and um, no, people don't talk about it, but Flip Wilson bought into Benihana's, the, uh, the restaurant chain, at a time and, and financed it, so he owned a, a, a large part of it. He didn't have to worry about money. That's why he quit. Um, he was, um, as I say, a fascinating character, but not only did he love black comedy, he really dissected humor and, and looked at it. There's a quote in here in talking about him where he talks about the fact that um, he could look at anything and see it six or seven different ways, which is the way comedians look at life. They don't look at things the same way we do. Most comics talk about uh, having a third eye or looking at things, uh, the burden of looking at things uh, and seeing, seeing it from at least two points of view. And so there's a tie up to a certain extent in, co extent in comedy to uh, Du Bois. And uh, right. uh, when Bois double consciousness. talks about double consciousness, for instance, he's talking about African Americans and the reason that African Americans have usually, I think, have re usually been so good at comedy is because they do have this double consciousness. They've been forced to look at the world in two different ways. And they are, they are really connected to the absurdity of what they see. Because they have to look at it from not only their personal point of view, which is telling me what I see is real, and then from the point of view from someone outside who's telling you, no, what you see is not real, here's the reality. So uh, African Americans have had to do that. I think uh, Steve Harvey talked about the third eye. Chris Rock talked about the burden of having to do this. Ralph Ellison also, also talked about it. He talked about, uh, yeah, double, uh, uh, double vision is what Ralph Ellison called it. Yeah. So it was a different kind of thing. Flip Wilson has this incredibly successful television show. Red Fox, who had been working for decades, becomes more famous because of Sanford and Son. Yeah. Um, Bill Cosby, who was famous, right, first with Fat Albert, but then, and the Bill Cosby show, yeah. but then the, the Cosby show in the 1980s. Um, do you think there's a way in which the success of black comedians were having on television, and then film, when you consider Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy after him, yeah. do you think that did something to the quality of, of stand-up? Right, well, in terms of the quality of stand-up, I, I think that yes, they all contributed to it, but I think Richard Pryor, uh, almost everyone would say that Richard Pryor changed comedy and uh, stand-up comedy totally because what he did was to uh, bring a, an element of uh, reality to it that none of the comics we've talked about, so even Gregory did not bring to it. And the reason is that Richard Pryor was so abundantly talented. He was an actor. He, uh, He's a writer, right? Yeah, he, was, he, should have, he could have been an Academy Award winning actor. He was that good. He, he could do um, impersonations, uh, you know, he could do, uh, in one of his movies he does a deer, he represents a deer, and that in itself is funny. And another, uh, uh, one of his <laughs> concerts, he has a situation where he walks across the stage. Uh, he's talking about uh, black people not being afraid of animals. You know the, the, the bit where he walks yeah. across yeah. and he uh, <clears throat> and, um, talks about the fact that white people or non-blacks are and he walks across the stage as a black person. He does this cool, this cool walk across the stage and he sees a snake and just sort of steps over it and says, oh, snake, and keeps walking. <laughs> and then he shows a non-black character walking by and he's sort of <laughs> shuffling through and uh, suddenly grabs his leg because he's bitten by the snake and he doesn't really what's happened. Just showing, <laughs> this, this kind of pantomime was something that Richard Pryor was capable of doing and almost no other comedian could do that. Dick Gregory couldn't do it. Uh, um, later, Eddie Murphy couldn't do it. Dave Chappelle can't do it, even though Dave Chappelle is a great comedian. But he can't do what Richard Pryor could do with those things. And, and, and Richard Pryor could do the other things also. So, so that was changing it. But I think what happened was the realistic nature of the comedy. And uh, in the 50s, comedy changed. As we sort of mentioned this earlier. There was a, uh, a, a time in the early 50s where at first it was two non-black comedians it was Mort Saul and Lenny Bruce who came along in the early 50s and sort of changed comedy in the sense that they dealt with it in a more realistic sense. They talked about the hypocrisy of the society. They talked about, they criticized the society. They talked about the fact that uh, many of the rules and uh, the, the pretenses that uh, were accepted as norms were in fact uh, barbarians in, in one way or another. So 
they started to deal with it. And Red Fox, in fact, calls uh, Lenny Bruce a hero, a genius. And so does Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory, in fact, points out Lenny Bruce as being one of the most important figures that he had dealt with and yeah. one of the people that led him to deal with comedy the way he did. In, <clears throat> in um, addition to some of the black comics right. that affected him. But he talked about Lenny Bruce. So Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul were very important in this. They start to change it. And Gregory takes it a notch higher when he's dealing with, with African-American comedy. But, uh, um, there's some quotes from Gregory where he talks about the fact that uh, Mort Saul up, up, upset uh, the conservatives. Uh, Lenny Bruce upset the Puritans. And he upset everybody because <laughs> so that's the way Gregory put it. But uh, you had that aspect of what was going on here. So Gregory starts to change it. Bill Cosby comes along and he changes it in another way. He follows him and Cosby is the first comic, the first African American comic to come along and force the mainstream non-blacks to look at him and accept him even though he's not doing black humor. He's not even telling any jokes that have anything to do with black people. So he's forcing them to look at him as a human being uh, regardless of what he's doing. And that is an immense breakthrough because we talked about, just mentioned earlier, up until the 50s, any black comic who went on stage had to be or represent that stage Negro. That is, even if they didn't wear the baggy pants and the, and the oversized shoes, the clownish attire, they had to speak with a certain kind of dialect and represent this image of the black man that had been set up by non-blacks in various um, mediums or earlier. So Cosby comes along and does something entirely different. He comes along and just uh, is himself and tells jokes and people accept him as being a comic without being <clears throat> black and not expecting him to really get into any black issues whatsoever. So that's another breakthrough. And then after him, to me, comes Flip Wilson who brings up the, the stories and, and really, uh, really swamps people. Uh, it's, uh, submerses people in black culture to a certain extent because what he's doing is characters that are so black and so funny without um, without diminishing those characters in fact but he's bringing them to life in such a way that people have to accept them as real people again and even though there was some criticism for Geraldine from uh, some some women uh, and, and, and some middle class some of the middle black middle class criticize it and of course, the clergy criticize the representation of Reverend Leroy, but, you, but there's always gonna be criticism in comedy because comedy pushes the edge. If you don't push the edge in comedy, you're not gonna get anywhere, and every good comic is gonna push it to a certain extent, and these guys all did it. And uh, one of the things that I point out is to me, the reason Richard Pryor then was able to change it totally is he took all of these elements we've been talking about. He took the satire and the wit of Dick Gregory. He took... Uh, Cosby's storytelling ability, or what they used to call lying in the black community, because that's an essential part of African American comedy, of comedy. Any black comedian, or most every black comedian, is an excellent storyteller. If the only one that's an exception to that really is Dick Gregory, because Dick Gregory told jokes, and most African American comedians don't tell jokes. If, if you look at, uh, if you look at Richard Pryor, or if you look at uh, Dave Chappelle. You look at uh, <coughs> Cosby and so forth. They're telling stories where the jokes are embedded in the story and they're using other elements to make you laugh. Uh, Cosby used his facial expressions, the mugging and what he did, the way he told the jokes uh, had to do with that. Uh, it's funny what, what, he's, what he does with those facial expressions and body language. Uh, there was another comedian, I don't know if he, it was comedian Robert Guillaume was his name. Who, who had a Robert Guillaume? Yeah, Robert Guillaume. Yeah. Yeah, Guillaume, yes. That's I, it. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he called it uh, mumbling on the face, and this is something that black comedians do all the time. That is, they'll say one thing, but your, the facial expression is telling you something entirely different. And uh, black comedians use those elements to get over to present the hypocrisy because comedy is based on contrast. It's based on opposition and the unexpected. In fact, a good joke is all about the unexpected. Uh, uh, I don't know, in the class that I do, I always point out a very simple uh, example of a joke from Richard Pryor uh, talking about uh, the courts, where he says, uh, I went down there looking for justice, and that's just what I found, or that's what I found, just us. So 
it's, it's that unexpected element that makes up a joke. And therefore, comedy always is with contrast. And if you don't push the elements, you're not going to be funny. So all of these people did that to a certain extent. But prior, anyway, uh, has the satire, the wit of uh, <coughs> Dick Gregory, the storytelling ability of, uh, of <coughs> Cosby. And he had also the, um, the characters that Flip Wilson did. Prior, Pryor's most famous character was a character named Mudbone. I don't know if, uh, you, if any of you <laughs> yep. have heard Mudbone. Again, if you haven't, you should go on YouTube and per perhaps listen to it. But Mudbone is a character from the old school. Uh, he's a character who represents that indirect, sly humor that black slaves had to use, that humor that was never shown in the mainstream at that point. It was, uh, it was hidden to a certain extent. And that's another element of, of, of African-American humor, I think, is um, what Gregory did was take that private humor, which had always been satiric, which had always been critical of the situation, even though blacks were pretending to accept it, uh, even though they were playing the role, like something uh, some people call misleading naivete, that is pretending to, to pretending to be stupid in order to get over, pretending that you don't, that you accept something in order to get over. Um, that was part of American, of uh, African American folklore, the private humor. And those stories are, are <coughs> kind of um, what much of the humor was built on, and uh, Gregory brought it out to a certain extent in, in terms of the wit and satire. Then you had the other comics who brought out other aspects of it, so it's, it changed comedy altogether. You've written about a hundred years of black comedy. You obviously pay attention very closely to it. How do you respond to it? What's your impression of the empire that Tyler Perry has built? <laughs> okay. Um. <coughs> Tyler Perry, when I first saw Tyler Perry, uh, uh, I thought that uh, some of the stuff that he was doing was absurd and, uh, it, and, and uh, debasing to a certain extent. I thought that he was really uh, doing something that uh, um, was degrading for black people, it, it's, it's, as much of the early comedy had been. And in fact, I still do, but uh, some of the early stuff. But I, then you realize what he really did was to, he felt that he had to do that because he started with nothing. He started doing these shows that traveled around, right, right. And personal shows, and he was done in, in churches for black, for black audiences and uh, played up religion and uh, this, uh, this sort of um, inner community, uh, lower class, uneducated side of black life, but had some wit to it, but it was, but it was basically un uneducated. Uh, lower class or working class people he was dealing with. And uh, he had some of them were actually foolish and, uh, and really were depicted in much the same way that uh, blacks had been depicted in Hollywood films up until a certain point, the early stuff that he did. But um, then you realize that he was able to take that and was smart enough that once he was, he was able to make enough money and to gain enough uh, influence to um, use those resources to do something entirely different. So in that sense, I guess you have to give him credit for it. He uh, muddied the waters a bit at the beginning, but uh, he managed to move on and to do something entirely different. And now he's one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. And many of the stories that he's doing now are entirely different than what he was doing then. So I have a, a great deal of respect for him. As I said, though, starting out, uh, in fact, I think I, I wrote something once criticizing some of the early stuff. So. You mentioned your great appreciation for Pryor, obviously Dick Gregory. Who do you think that's visible and working regularly these days kind of hold that legacy up of the comedians who came, you know, two generations ago? I think the, the, the closest, well, the two. Uh, Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle, to me, are the two comedians the most... Uh, uh, prominent and uh, influential comics now. Uh, Chris Rock, because he is more in the vein of Dick Gregory and uh, it's more political satire, it's, uh, it's satirical uh, stuff, although he tell, does tell some stories. But Chris Rock does tell some jokes occasionally. Chris Rock is not a, is a, not a comedian who's basically or altogether a storyteller. 
he does use jokes, but he is focused on political satire, on uh, dealing with, on unmasking the uh, hypocrisy that he sees in the society, the pretenses that he sees, and that's always a job of comedy. I think in general comedy, whether it's African American or mainstream or just comedy in general, a definition, is that good comedy unmasked pretense. It reveals people who are pretending to be something they're not, or unmasks people who are corrupt when they're pretending to be, um, in fact, uh, virtuous. So that is a, that's part of the job of comedy. Chris Rock uh, did it. Uh, all the great comedians did it. And I, I'm going to just mention Burt Williams for a minute here because I want to get back to him. But even as early as Burt Williams, who was the first African American comic, and some people at the turn of the, in the well, in the early 1900s, thought that he was the best comedian in, in America. Even though other people like Charlie Chaplin and very famous comedians were around, Burt Williams was. Uh, to me, one of the best around. And one of the things he did was he was able to take that stage Negro and bring him alive in a certain way that no one else could do. Because everyone else did that stage Negro, that, that Sambo character. And I don't know if, that, if that's meaningful to anyone. Uh, I, I hope it is. Sambo character is a character who is the docile Negro who is ignorant and uh, totally uh, committed to uh, following the rules and supporting his masters, uh, if he's a slave and if not his bosses, whatever, he's someone who's not going to in any way shake up the world or roil the waters in any way. He's going to stay re exactly where, in his place exactly and do exactly what's expected of him. So that Sambo character was uh, presented and um, had been created by white minstrel performers on stage early on in the 19th century. Burt Williams comes along and, and, and takes that character and enlivens it to such an extent that he humanizes it. And when Burt Williams did it, he made that character come alive in a different way, uh, which is it's almost unheard of to think that you could do that. And one way of looking at it, to me, one way I look at it, if, uh, for the people who read the book, is that Step and Fetch It did the same character, but Step and Fetch It went at it a different way, and Step and Fetch It did it by exaggerating the stupidity of the character, exaggerating the laziness of the character, exaggerating to such an extent that it became absurd. And anyone who thought that that character that Stephen Fetchett was doing wasn't, had anything to do with reality, to me, uh, is a, a little bit off target because he was a clown. The character that he did, if you look at the, 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 what he was dressed in, he, he dressed as if he were a clown. You almost have to look at that character as the same way you look at a circus clown except he was a black circus clown, doing a, an, an exaggerated take or depicting an exaggeration of what mainstream America expected black people to be. And he did it to be funny. Burt Williams did something else. He took the character and gave him wit. He was sort of the, the, uh, the fool as philosopher. So even though he spoke as if he didn't know anything, he spoke as if he were dumb, he spoke as if he accepted uh, all of the restrictions and limitations that had been imposed upon him. Basically, in his dialogue, he showed that he did not. And there was wit embedded in what he was saying. So you had a different kind of character with Burt Williams. And you have this later on with um, various characters. Blacks, once Dick Gregory comes along, you didn't have to pretend to be the uh, wise or the fool as wise man. You could be you could be the wise man. You could come out and directly criticize the society. So there was that side of it, and it was a different thing. I mean, when you consider in the late 80s, in the early 90s, to your point about Bill Cosby, you know, Bill Cosby's writing parenting books, <laughs> you know, that, that white folks love, <laughs> for, yeah. for the most part. Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he's been taking that seriously. It was no longer, and, and that's, that's a great breakthrough. Uh, just a, a funny story. When, when On the Real Side came out, uh, Bill Cosby called me because he wasn't satisfied with the way he was portrayed in the book. And he had a two-hour conversation and lectured me on how I should write the book. Which is, Cosby had a tendency to do that kind of thing and tell people what to do. But um, he, after the, the conversation, I, was, I kept telling him, but look, I'm saying that you don't fit tightly into any concept of what African-American humor is, but in fact, that's the greatest breakthrough you're making. Is the fact that you're not doing it. You're a black man who is standing on stage doing comedy 
Everybody expects you to do black comedy, and you're not, and yet you're the most popular comic in America. Right. So it's, it, it's, it was amazing to me. So uh, it, there's that aspect of, uh, of Cosby and why he was so popular and why he was believed. What you just, uh, you're, you're mentioning the way mainstream America believed in him. He was considered the nation's father at one time. Yeah. Uh, and how far the mighty fall. <laughs> but Marshall Warfield visited the class about a month ago. Uh, last week we watched uh, Whoopi Goldberg's documentary of Moms Mabley. Yeah. Um, we haven't, I don't think, ever seen any black women comedians that have emerged with the kind of visibility and popularity of a Pryor, of a Dick Gregory, um, of a Chris Rock or, or Dave Chappelle. Um, who are some of the black women comedians that you think have been particularly effective, effective in what they do? And what are the reasons why you think that they haven't had that kind of breakthrough moment? Well, first of all, just female comics in general have been, uh, have, uh, been subjected to the same kind of limitations that uh, African Americans have. Uh, the society is just starting to realize that uh, females were uh, subjugated and um, restricted perhaps as much or, or more than African Americans to some extent. You have to, we have to deal with that. In fact, women were not allowed to vote until way after Theoretically, African males could vote, for instance, and so that uh, the prejudice that exists in society was there all along. Female comedians were also uh, uh, stereotyped in the same way African Americans were. I'm talking about the stage Negro, but there was a there was a stereotype of um, female comedians also that existed just among white comedians before anything ever happened. Uh, the reason Moms Mabley was so successful, in fact, is because she was wise enough to uh, depict a character, a grandmother who would be acceptable on the stage. Uh, so she could then do things that the average woman could not do. If the av average woman had done some of the stuff that Moms made of was doing in the 30s, they probably would have been jailed. In fact, Mae West was um, persecuted because she did some of those things. All that come up and see me sometimes and the, the overt sexuality right. that she right. demonstrated caused her to be actually kicked out of Hollywood and they uh, actually brought in censors to change the way f movies were done in Hollywood because of Mae West, because of a woman doing it. Moms Mabley got away with it because, uh, first of all, she was doing it before black audiences and the mainstream, uh, as usual, decided, okay, if, as long as you keep it over here, it's okay. Just don't bring it into our, our uh, our mainstream venues. But Moms maybe was criticizing men in, in a way that was unheard of in, in the 20s and 30s. I, it's like uh, uh, you know, stuff, I, the favorite joke was of course about old men, <clears throat> old men and young men and uh, that, that part of it. One of, them, one of her things is, so, well there are several, there's nothing that, a, that a, an old man can do f for me except bring me a message from a young man. Uh, I'd rather, uh, <laughs> I'd rather pay a young man's uh, fare from California to here than to go visit an old man down the corner. Uh, that sort of <laughs> was stuff. the one, one I remember from last week where she was like, uh, you know, being with an old man is like watching an old man try to push a car up the hill with a string, <laughs> yeah. with a rope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is packed with so much of a metaphor. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's, and it's, you know, it's males, it's sometimes hurtful what she says. So it's, it's, uh, but she was talking, you know, she was actively critical of, of males at a time when women were not uh, permitted to do that. So it, it was a breakthrough uh, in terms of what she was doing and finally when she did get some publicity and she finally was able to appear at the Apollo and make some money in the, the 60s, I, I guess it was, or late 50s and 60s, she started to get some recognition. She, uh, she was accepted as being uh, as great or as influential as she really was. And, uh, in terms of what's happening now with, with women comedians, my favorite woman comedian right now is Wanda Sykes. But it's, uh, uh, again, she's, she's in the vein of uh, Chris Rock or Dick Gregory, I, as far as I'm concerned. She, talks, she speaks directly. It's, it's satirical. It's witty. She talks about uh, she's unafraid to uh, engage any issue. She doesn't pull back from anything. And she's uh, uh, forthright in what she has to say. And she's smart as hell. So it's... Uh, she really is a repres representative of, of a different world because women comedians could not do that before. Moms had to don a disguise in order to do it. 
uh, and, and, and also mom's baby did a lot of political stuff, and she did it in the folksy way. Right. She, yeah. The joke, one of my favorite jokes, the joke about the driving down south and uh, um, going through a red light in a southern town is one of my favorites, of course. And that's the way she did it. The joke is she's in the south and she goes through a red light and the cops comes over and asks her, well, you know, go ahead. Go ahead you oh, go ahead. And, and asked her um, why she went through the red light. And she says, well, I saw you white folks going through the, the green light. I thought the red light was for us. <laughs> But that's how her satire worked. It was, in, and she could get away with that. Again, that's it. She was, she used uh, the folklore, the folk humor of African Americans, and brought them to, brought it to the stage in a way that um, many comedians did not do. And those kind of jokes would not have been allowed in the 1920s and 30s on almost any stage. You would have had to have, had to have done that joke as she did in a Chitlin circuit joint where it was owned by a black person, basically, because if you brought it to, to uh, even a, an all black audience in a, in a theater or venue was, was owned by whites, it would have been heavily criticized. Certainly, it would never would have occurred at a mix, before a mixed audience at that time. So, and, but Wanda Sykes is a derivative uh, of her and uh, is, is one of the people influenced by someone like Mom Swainley. We weren't watching any of this on TV. We were sitting in dorm rooms listening to cassettes yeah. of Eddie Murphy's stand-up. Um, yeah. and, and the fact that it came out that way and resonated with us, right? But some of that changes when he becomes this movie star figure. Yeah, and he moves away from comedy to a yeah. certain extent because he's thinking of coming back. I'm, I'd like to see. They say that he's working clubs now and putting together an act. It would be fun to, it'll be fun to see what he does. It, uh, it, it was at one point he was really really funny and uh, one of the best uh, I hope he comes back I still think comedy is uh, one of the one of the highest arts that uh, we have and the people who are very good at it are just amazing simply amazing because it gives you a chance to both um, do something that's uh, that's critically important and it's uplifting for the people that listen to it because it causes them to take a second look at the situation they're in. It causes them to take a second look at themselves at times uh, because good humor means that you, or good comedy usually means that you're capable of reassessing yourself and laughing at what's funny about you. Because if you don't think there's something funny about you, then you got a problem. Because there's something funny about all of us and the people who are really healthy know that. And that's what comedy sort of teaches people, I think. So I think it's high art. Yeah. Professor Watkins, thank you very much. You're